Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly uh, podcast slash internet radio show in which we uh, discuss uh, virtually anything having to do with the Beatles, either their history or what's happening today. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and uh, I'm here with uh, with my three cohorts in uh, three different areas of the country, uh, up in uh, 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 the, the great state of Connecticut, the uh, the host of the uh, the internet slash uh, terrestrial radio sh- Beatles radio show, uh, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hi, Al. How's everyone doing? Great, Ken. And out in uh, out on the West Coast, the uh, uh, the reporter for Beatles uh, for Beatles Examiner and, and various other Examiner columns for Examiner dot com, uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. And up in the great state of Maine, uh, our resident musicologist and uh, classical music savant and longtime contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine as well, uh, Alan Cozen. Hey, Al, how are you doing? Good, Alan. Great. Now, we're going to discuss something which, um, as Tom Francione said uh, last week, uh, is uh, pretty much mind-blowing to him, and that is the 20th anniversary of the, the overall Beatles anthology project. Uh, it was 20 years ago, actually last week, because Thanksgiving was a little bit early that year, but it was Thanksgiving week in 1995. That the uh, that ABC telecast the uh, six hours um, uh, in three parts of the uh, of the Beatles anthology, which included the world debuts of something that uh, that people I think Beatle fans didn't think they would ever be able to hear, and that is that was in effect new music by the Beatles. So it was uh, it was a very special time, and then that was followed up by three two-disc sets of uh, 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 full of rarities and uh, uh, alternate takes and all kinds of things, uh, followed up by uh, a large coffee table book on the anthology, basically kind of a print version of the, um, of, of the, the video. And then, and then finally, well, not even finally, uh, the videotape, of the show, plus a good deal more material that was released in the fall of uh, 1996, followed uh, some years later, I think about 2003, Alan, is, the, yeah, yeah. is that correct? The DVD, sure. Yeah, by a, a DVD version, which had even more material. And plus, uh, in s- at least some parts of it, 5.1 surround sound. So it's uh, it's it's a major a major event with a capital E in uh, in in the history of, uh, of the Beatles and certainly the I did a piece for Beatle Fan Magazine in uh, uh, in the fall of '96 in which I talked about how much fun this whole experience was and it was something because I think you know I think probably probably Ken is going to disagree. But I think by the mid '90s, a lot of us had become eh, somewhat jaded as as Beatle fans, and uh, this uh, this gave us a whole new uh, a, a whole new enthusiasm. So, what do you mean by jaded? Um, I, it, I think it, it's hmm, it's hard to explain, but I think people, I think the average fan wasn't really all that excited by each new release as they were, uh, as they had been some years before. Oh, you yeah, mean the solo releases? Uh, well, yeah, by that point, because obviously until, until the Live at the BBC collection, there hadn't been any new group releases, uh, especially new group releases, you know, in, in a very long time. And, and uh, the last few kind of archival releases, not even, they weren't even archival, they were just compilations that came out in the late 70s and early 80s, there was less and less excitement with each one. 
I would agree with you. I would agree with you on that. Mm-hmm. Although where the where the solo music is concerned, the years leading up to it, you still had George's big comeback with Cloud Nine and the Traveling Wilburys. So, you know, and you had Paul with Flowers in the Dirt and Off the Ground leading into the BBC and uh, the Beatles anthology. But I think that his record sales were starting to taper Mm -hmm. at that point. Definitely, I will agree with you there. Mm -hmm. I think you nailed it when you said enthusiasm, because I think because there had been kind of a flat period before that. And, you know, and and there had been rumors off and on that that this was going to happen. And, you know, it never, you know, it never came about. And in fact, they did, there were a couple of, of aborted, there was at least one aborted version. And so, I mean, you know, I, I don't know that anybody really thought this would eventually happen, especially after, you know, without John, but it did. And, you know, and thankfully it did, it came out and thankfully they got it before George passed. And, and um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, that's really good that they, they were finally able to get it together. Uh, well, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the novelty of the, thematically driven compilations rock and roll rock and roll music love songs mm-hmm. then real music right. then 20 greatest hits i think that really had worn off by then oh, really so is. and there was a you know a long drought there between 20 greatest hits and live at the bbc right so right and not only that i mean some of those one of the reasons i think that we became jaded as al said is that you know 20 greatest hits had such you know incredibly insightful programming as a truncated Hey Jude. (laughs) Real music was also pretty much, uh, you know, I don't know, people thought of it as a a bit of a waste of time. I mean, Mm -hmm. there was that that medley, which was, you know, it was okay, but, you know, no one I don't think really saw, this was in the pre-mashup days and everything, and no one saw the point of making a new medley of Beatles film songs. And, uh, yeah, I, I think we sort of we're beginning to look at EMI as having really nothing much interesting to say. And in fact, the Mm -hmm. Beatles thought so too. I mean, you know, they were at the time as well involved in what became ultimately a 20 year lawsuit from 69 to 89. Mm -hmm. And part of the settlement of that suit, the, the terms, the relatively few terms that leaked out were that, EMI could do nothing in terms of reissues and releases and compilations without the Beatles' approval. And at that point, way back then, in 89, the only thing they were even considering approving were the Red and Blue albums, Mm -hmm. which eventually they put out in the early 90s. I think, you know, in those days, I don't think they would have even considered something like one. I mean, they, they, their thinking evolved in different ways over the years, Mm -hmm. but, you know, and I think also, you know, we, we, we should probably look back a little bit at the history of what became the anthology because it, it first came to anyone's attention in one of John's interviews and I can't remember which. It, it probably was one of the ones towards the end of his life, um, either the BBC or the David Chef interview, mm-hmm. where he said, yeah, you know, they're putting together a history of the Beatles. It'll no doubt be called Long and Winding Road. Right. <laughs> you know, and the Long and Winding Road, such as it was, recently came out on a bootleg. And mm-hmm. we got to see what they were, you know, what Neil Aspinall's first cut of it was. Mm-hmm. Um which was really just a bunch of clips. And I think once they settled the 1989 lawsuit with, without which there could have been no discussions of any archival stuff. In fact, the sessions album, which was going to come out in about, I think 19, well, they were talking about it as early as 1983. Right. They had put that together. They had sent out tapes to various of the EMI territories and the Beatles nixed it. And Mm -hmm. at EMI at the time thought, well, okay, actually we have the right to do this, but they didn't want to offend the Beatles. So when the Beatles nixed it, they just shelved it and they nixed it really as a a strategic move. You know, it wasn't necessarily that they were against it because pretty much everything on sessions came out on anthology. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. But they they didn't want EMI. They didn't want to establish that precedent of EMI trawling through 
the archives and putting out stuff without the Beatles necessarily involved. So nothing mm. like the BBC set sessions, anything could have come out before the 1989 settlement. That right. that made everything possible. And that led to, I think, the revival of Long and Winding Road, mm-hmm. which got its name changed partly because George, from everything I heard when I was reporting on it at the time, objected to it being named after one of Paul's songs. Mm-hmm. You know, why not have it named <laughs> really? after? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not called I, I Me Mine either. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, I think his feeling was that it shouldn't be it shouldn't be anybody's song. It should be it should have a title of its own. And uh, and that's what eventually happened and you know there was a lot of there was a lot of backstage politics about this and they took a really long time to get everything together to acquire film and video uh, from television stations around the world like in paris uh right sweden all of those things you know apple didn't have that i mean they assembled a lot of their archive in the years that went into preparing for the anthology so and and the turning point Mm. was uh was at that uh juncture i think in 92 or 93 at one of the at uh, i believe one of the award shows when uh, when Yoko gave Paul the um, I guess cassette tapes at that point right. of uh, of the three the three songs of uh, mm-hmm. the the, uh, the three Lennon demos that they that became the the Threedal sessions right mm-hmm. because actually until then you know Paul and George mentioned a couple of times that they were working on this thing that mm-hmm. wasn't yet being called the Beatles anthology. So for, for years, we sort of knew that they were working on it. And what they talked about was, you know, maybe we'll play some incidental music for it. Right. So everyone mm-hmm. expected that, you know, okay, we would have a little bit of Beatles studio jamming as the background music for this set. But even mm-hmm. that would have seemed kind of interesting to me. You know, I would have wanted to I would have wanted to hear that without the documentary going over it too. Just mm-hmm. hear what they did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think Yoko giving them the tracks sort of changed the the approach of what they were thinking of doing. Right. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, Bill King got a uh, uh, a major exclusive uh, when he found out about the, uh, the 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 certainly the Free as a Bird sessions. And in fact, uh, Alan, if you recall, uh, Bill got it into a Beatle fan extra. And in fact, it may have been the very first Beatle fan extra, uh, which came out with uh, in a, in uh, packaged with a new issue of Beatle fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what this was in February or March of '94. So that's how far back uh, the excitement began to build. And uh, and certainly by the by the fall of ninety five, uh, unless Alan, you've got some other detail. You know, it's funny because I thought I had that exclusively, and I'd have to look back and see. Um, well, he may have credited see, you. I, I haven't read it. In a oh, long I don't know. Time. I don't know. But I had heard from a um, you know friend of all of us in England about what was going on with those sessions soon after they happened, mm-hmm. and it was kind of funny in a you know in a newspaper world sort of way. I wrote this piece about that they. They were recording this song that they had had the sessions and uh, it was going to come out when they did their their documentary. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we had a copy editor who gave the piece the headline, will they or won't they? They will, it seems. (laughs) Not mentioning. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And so the piece was widely ignored and newsday which was competing with us this is when i was at the times Mm -hmm. um actually called its classical music critic and said you have to follow this up you have to do a piece about this so he called me and said you wouldn't believe it they're making me do something about (laughs) beatles piece and you know what can you tell me i mean he didn't he did not only didn't want to report it but he didn't really have the connections to report it. And we were friends and I'd already written my piece. And so it didn't matter. So I just gave him a bunch of info and he wrote a piece. 
that night on television news in New York because their copy editor put the Beatles in the headline and it caught someone's attention. Mm -hmm. Television news said Newsday has exclusively. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) The Beatles are going to be recording again. I was so angry. (laughs) But, Uh, you know, that's the world. That's what happens, you know. That's typical of this business. It really is. Yeah. But, you know, Mm -hmm. but it was exciting hearing about these things and also that, um, you know, the next year, I think that when they recorded the next one, you Mm -hmm. know, all of these things were, you know, everything was sort of building up to the anthology coming out and having these tracks and, you know, which they were really good about, um, you know, I went to Inglewood interviews for a couple of pieces I was doing for the times about the anthology and they let me see the videos while I was there. And they were in a slightly different format from the American versions. They were one hour each Mm -hmm. and they were also not finished. Um, They, they had some things that were later changed and no matter what I tried though, I could not get them to let me hear free as a bird. Um, I went to, strangely enough, a storyboard meeting with the video director when they were planning to do the video for Free as a Bird. So I kind of knew what the video was going to be, but had no idea what the song was going to sound like, you know? Wow. So it was very, it was, in a way it was exciting and it was frustrating. And it was, it was also, it was also kind of nice hearing it at the same time as everybody else. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, on the Friday morning, before the first telecast, Scott Shannon on WPLJ in New York talked about the anthology, talked about the new songs, specifically uh, Free as a Bird. But he said, I can't play the, uh, the, you know, the finished product because we don't have it. Mm-hmm. So what he did was he from one of the one of the various, you know, Lost London Tapes bootlegs played. Mm. What he figured was probably the demo that was used for for the finished product, mm-hmm. but that's all he could play. He wasn't, he, you know, because they had they had been able to uh, to mm. shield the uh, the finished product so well. In fact, Steve, you know, you were in you were in TV production at that time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what? What kind of efforts were you making to try to unearth all of this? Well, I was, I mean, I was, uh, I was more in a, in um, the production of the, the TV coverage, not the, or not, I wasn't on the front line. I wasn't the one reviewing the tapes. Mm -hmm. We had another guy that was doing that. So I didn't really get to see anything beforehand, but I mean, I was getting all the publicity shots and the, the CD ROMs that they sent out that are now, you know, they're now well known as collector's items, but I was getting that stuff. And I, there were some video clips on the CD ROMs that I got to see, but I mean, I didn't get to see the full thing beforehand, but I mean, we knew, we knew this was big because I remember we made it the cover of the TV magazine. I was the editor of that magazine. And so it was fun being able to put the the Beatles and we used the let it be pictures on, on our cover. And I got to, I can't remember what the headline uh, was that I wrote, but I mean, it said Beatles definitely. <laughs> mm-hmm. actually, but we got, <laughs> yeah, you know, Go actually, um, I I got the um, advanced cassettes from ABC TV as well. They came in a really nice binder, and they did not have "Free as a Bird" or "Real Love" in them. They only sure. had the show. So mm-hmm. wow. So even Steve, if you had managed to talk your reviewer into giving you the copy, it wouldn't have been there. Hmm. And do we need to explain to people what CD-ROMs are? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what they, I mean, uh, it was it was kind of a burgeoning thing in that at that time. Mm-hmm. But I used to get I used to get CD-ROMs from a lot of different companies or d- different networks because they would have photographs on them that we could use to reproduce. I mean, it wasn't nearly as sophisticated as it was now. And I mean, everything is all digital now. I and mean, we were still doing, I think, prints back then too. But I mean, in this case, they sent out CD-ROMs with with uh, digital photos of the Beatles from all different mm-hmm. years. There was text on them. I can't remember what else was on them, but there was all sorts of stuff on them. And 
And in fact, I re- the one thing that was funny was, and Alan, you may remember this, they had time limitations on them. Do you remember that? Yeah, vaguely. Cal- they had calendar limitations that you only could play them the way they were set up in a certain time. Of course, you can. they didn't lock the photos or anything, so even if you have a copy of them now, you can still get to the photos. But you can't, uh, because they were all set up under earlier versions of QuickTime and everything like that, you couldn't play them for what they are, you know, for the programming on them outside. Well, I, think of you could, I think you could go in and reset the clock on your computer to fool it into thinking that it was that's, earlier than it was. That's true, too. You could still do that, but, I mean, is it worth doing, you know, that's kind of no. crazy. <laughs> no. no, but, yeah, I mean, that's what you, that's what you would have to do to play it you know to play it now or to to play it outside the time period but it was they had and i remember they had all these limit all these things about you couldn't use the pictures outside of you know outside of the anthology i mean they do the same thing today i mean for some of the stuff that i mean some of the pictures that um that were set up for one had limitations on them like that too but i think celebrities do that as a matter of course just to kind of focus you know the the newspapers and the publicity and on when they, you know, on what you're publicizing. But yeah, I mean, they, they did that too. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was strange. And, but I remember sitting down like everybody else. I mean, I sat, I was on the couch that night watching free as a bird for the first time, like everybody else was, of course. But what was funny was that they managed to keep it out of the shops and nobody, I mean, you realize if this had been now, it would have been, it would have been way out of, you know, it would have been all over the internet before, before the broadcast. Mm-hmm. Well, not, that's not necessarily because, for instance, there have been a couple, two or three recent examples of albums that were really kept under wraps. Uh, Beyonce's last album, this new Adele album, uh, 25, they were, they were kept under wraps until absolutely right as they were scheduled to be released. You know, but you're talking about now versus then. I mean, uh, yeah, the, te- yeah, the exactly. technology wasn't as, as advanced then. Yeah. As it, I mean, I remember getting... Beatles uh, advanced CDs, for example, Yellow Submarine Songtrack. Mm-hmm. And Alan, you probably had one of these with your name on them. Do you, do mm-hmm. you have one of those? Yeah, yeah, I do too. I mean, that you know, to keep you from putting the tracks out on the internet, and um, I mean, they do the uh, you know watermarking and all that stuff, which everybody does now. I mean, that's you know, but I mean, there was all sorts of things, you know. To hey, uh, the worst the worst example I saw was George's posthumous album. When you could finally talk them into giving you a copy, seeing as you had to review it in time for it, to, the review to hit just before it came out. So you mm-hmm. needed to hear it, and there was no way around that. They sent it in a CD player, a portable CD player, oh, which was yeah. glued shut. Yes. <laughs> and the headphone was glued into the thing so you couldn't even take a patch cord out of the headphone jack and copy it analog onto a computer oh my there was nothing you could do uh (laughs) i never i i I never had that uh, problem i never i never got that so wow that's amazing amazing Amazing. now that's now ken you were in now you of course you've been in radio for forever uh, and I, and I, believe- <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, I'm a dinosaur is what you're exactly. saying. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I think, um, uh, you were now, were, were you at ABC radio at that point? Um, I was working for an independent syndicator called radio today. Yes, that was, um, and it was still radio today. Then we were bought out by ABC Disney. Uh, in 1998, so this was still radio today, but I was also on the air on uh, B103 on Long Island, their oldie station, when the Beatles anthology came out, and I did a a bunch of specials on the anthology too, Mm -hmm. mixed that in with everything else, so it was an exciting time, definitely. You know, there's something that you brought up just before, Al, Mm -hmm. about um, the Lost Lennon tapes, and uh, the fact that, you know, Free as a Bird aired there first. I think that for some Beatle fans, while it was certainly exciting to hear Free as a Bird, the Beatles version, as well as Rio Love, which actually first was placed on the Imagine John Lennon soundtrack. And actually, before that, it was on the Lost Lennon Yes. So for for a lot of of fans, they knew those songs 
before the Beatle versions came out. And I'm wondering how many of them. Uh, to me, the version of Free as a Bird is kind of close to what I thought the Beatles version would sound like anyway. Mm. That's just my own personal opinion. Although I thought it was a really nice touch that Paul got to sing lead in the middle and then George got a lead. So he actually had three Beatles on lead vocals on Free as a Bird. I thought that was great. That was one of the wonderful things about that recording. And Real Love is kind of close to what I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. So it, it must have been a different experience altogether for the fans that didn't know those early versions yeah. from the Lost Lennon tapes. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, as I said earlier, you know, it, the, the, it was something that was completely unique in that I think, you know, most, you know, most fans after, after John was murdered, you know, had totally, you know, that, that seemed to eliminate the, any possibility of any kind of Beatles reunion of any kind, mm. whether it was live or in the studio or whatever. So mm -hmm. this was, this was, you know, the first and, uh, um, with the, you know, the two songs, the only chance they would ever hear, uh, they would ever have to hear new Beatles music. Right. You know, so, uh, so yeah, if they, if they were not familiar with those two songs from the Lost Lennon tapes, uh, it, it was a completely new experience that right. you know that even the you know even those of us who went all the way back to the 60s had not had since then mm -hmm. so in that vein guys what were you, you know since you weren't able to hear the song until you were you weren't able to hear free as a bird until that sunday night what were you imagining they would be like did you have any kind of sort of oral vision of what those two songs would would be like I thought actually that they were that the versions that came out were pl pretty close to what I envisioned. Right. Only I didn't know with Free as a Bird that Paul and George would get a lead vocal. Yeah, there. Um, it could have been all John, but actually no, they had to clean up that middle bit that wasn't finished. Yeah. the whatever happened to bit, right? Because that wasn't fully written, so they they had to add more to that. Mm -hmm. And John hadn't sung, you know, whatever had to be finished. He needed someone else to to do a lead vocal there. Right. So um, it really was kind of close to what I, you know, I think Jeff Lynn said, or I'm not sure who said it, but the the recording of Free as a Bird is what the Beatles would have sounded like in 1995 anyway. And I kind of agree. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that is the sound. If if they were together, if John was alive, obviously John's vocals would have sounded better on the recording. But that's close to what it would have been, I think. Mm -hmm. I you know I honestly didn't think that they would do as good a job as they did. I didn't think I thought there would be more John on there than there was. Um, and I so in that respect, I think they did a fantastic job. Oh, in, in what job. way? In what way did you expect them to have more of John on there? Well, I mean, I thought that they would stick. They wouldn't. They wouldn't change, add as much to it as they did. Ah, um, okay. And I. You know, in that respect, I think they did a, you know, Jeff Lynn did a great job. And they, well, they all did a great job, I think, there. But, yeah, I really didn't expect it was going to, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't remember. I'm, 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 you know, I'm pretty certain I heard, had heard the demo, but I really didn't think, you know, I, I, when I sat there and listened to it, I was, number one, I was, it was great to hear them singing again because we didn't think that was going to happen. Exactly. And it was, and it was closure for, it was closure for everybody. I mean, yeah. that, you know, uh, that, that's the big thing. It was closure for us. It was closure for that. Certainly it was closure for them. And I'd love to at some point, and I'm sure it'll never happen, hear them say that, but you know, it'll never happen. But yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's really what was so great. And I, I and I, I'm sure, you know, there were Beatle fans all over the country, all over the world were crying their eyes out, you know, just listening to that thing. It, you know, it was just amazing. It really was. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's one other thing. There's certain solo songs the Beatles have given us through the years where I'm sure many of us have said that could have been a Beatles record. Mm -hmm. You know, like John talked about Woman. That was his Beatles song mm -hmm. on Double Fantasy. Yeah. You know. Sometimes, you know, I, when I heard Free as a Bird originally on the Lost Lennon tapes, it sounded like it could have been a Beatles song. Mm -hmm. There are just certain songs that they've done on their own that you could have envisioned the Beatles backing the songs up. Mm -hmm. Free as a Bird is one of those songs for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know about real love so much, but definitely 
free as a bird has that feel to me perhaps <laughs> maybe it's the maybe it's the piano part the chord progressions whatever for some reason free as a bird sounds like it could have always been a beatles recording perhaps yeah. that's, that's why the that was the first one they did right yeah right alan what what were you kind of expecting going cuz since obviously you had by that time you were very familiar with the you know the various demos of the song from the Lost right. Island tapes and from yeah that. yeah knowing the demo sort of you knew sort of what the song was and uh, my spies had told me that um, George's slide guitar would be prominent but that was really all I knew for me it wasn't closure it was sort of closure <laughs> mm, really. Um, Yes. It was what? I'm sorry, I I didn't hear that word. Open sure. Kind of cut Open out. Open sure, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But you know what I mean. And what I mean by that is, you know, because that record was, to me, so beautiful, the harmonies, the playing, what they did with that, you know, piano and vocal demo. I mean, it was there was it was pretty spare and what they did was they made a really beautiful texture out of it and the with all of those elements that make the beatles the beatles and to me it just was you know yet another you know why can't you guys just get it together and keep being a band you know mm. um even if there's mm. only 3 of you i don't care you know the music that you're making on this track just shows what you've got that so many other, you know, continuing concerns don't have, you know, just just put all the stuff aside and, and make some more records as the three dolls. I don't care. You know, uh, I just I, I you know, I, I, I think I liked it so much that I just sort of felt that I, I wish they could do more. And uh, so. So, yeah, it wasn't closure, really. But uh, for of, me, of course, later on, you heard the details of the sessions and saw the bits that were uh, on the DVD version of right. the anthology. And you, you saw why it was probably only going to be those uh, two or three songs because there were, there were obviously tensions even there, you know, especially with uh, Paul as usual. Uh, <laughs> But there were always tensions. Yeah, and right. Those tensions, those tensions sort of lead to, you know, if everybody is sort of happy in a group, uh, probably it's not going to be that fascinating. You know, yeah. there's these things, you know, people play off each other and sometimes the frustrations lead you to, to do things. I think we've, most of us have been in bands. You know what it's like to have to deal with a drummer. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, and or, or whatever, you know, and, and, um, and, it's it doesn't matter because to me the finished product is is really all that matters i mean the fact that they may have been fighting like cats and dogs during the white album is kind of a historically interesting point but mm -hmm. the white album is the white album you know yeah. mm -hmm. i you know i i'm going to i'm going to probably be in the minority but i'm kind of glad they didn't finish now and then because those first two cut you know the uh, free as a bird and real love are so great mm -hmm. that that if now and then had turned out to be anything less it would have you know brought everything down a notch and would have been and, an anti-climax uh, anti mm -hmm. yeah and so i i mean as uh you know i know that every time the story comes up every few years about you know whether paul mentioned you know paul i think was the last one to mention it mm -hmm. um and you know and people get all excited oh they're gonna put it out they're gonna put it out you know no please you know let's just we have what we have let's just leave it at that especially since we don't have george around let's mm -hmm. just leave it well i think know. that's why they didn't put it out i think they you know they had a, a really very high quality control standard and i think they looked at what they were doing with it and just didn't think it was going to be as good. And, and right. that's, that's why. So, you know, I, I, but you know, I wasn't thinking despite... of them just keeping on doing Lennon demos. I was thinking the three of them could, you know, do some new stuff of their own. Yeah. Well, despite what you had just said, Alan, mm -hmm. there are a lot of fans out there that think that those two songs, uh, you know, that either they weren't well executed, they didn't like Jeff Lynn's production, it was all a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get a lot of people with, you know, negative feedback. That's true. Regarding those two songs, especially the ones that keep saying it's not part of the Beatles canon, you know. And uh, as we said, like, like we were talking week? about the last show. Yeah. 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 I knew a so, music uh, critic that, that felt that way, that 
the music the, the music critic at the if he's he's probably listening to the show um at the paper that I work for got into it with me and and thought it was you know thought Freeze a Bird was terrible because of the fact that you know it shouldn't have been done and uh, and I of course had to disagree with him you know but I mean I I'm sure there were other people probably more not real you know I think the real diehard fans basically felt you know, pretty happy about it. But, uh, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of people like Ken said that, you know, also felt that they shouldn't have done it. And, you know, I, I mean, I think that's kind of unfair actually, because yeah. they did such a great job with it. There were, uh, you know, there were people at the time who were sort of, may, you know, maybe not uh, a part of Beatle fandom, but certainly more of the, you know, the mass media, mm-hmm. mass uh, population mm-hmm. who were saying, well, it's nothing, but the, nothing uh, more than, you know, Hank Williams working, you know, being reunited with Hank Williams Jr. on a, right. you know, on a record, you know, the same kind of mm-hmm. thing as just electronic, uh, digital, hocus pocus. Mm-hmm. Natalie Cole. Natalie Cole was yeah. somebody else that they mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Because especially since uh, her Grammy Award winning performance of uh, duet with her father on Unforgettable was only a couple of years before, uh, right. before the anthology project uh, came uh, came to light. Yeah, but there's a, there's a big difference there because when you're dealing with the Nat King Cole and the Hank Williams, you've got professional recordings exactly. being mixed together. Exactly. And Jeff Lynne had to work miracles yes. with a with a mono cassette recording with hiss on it, you know, from John at the Dakota. And so I think he worked wonders with it. Yeah. But, you know, you're always going to have that issue with Beatle fans that it's best to leave well enough alone. Mm. And even if the three of them had reunited, and to some of us it would have been fascinating, there'll always be so many people that the, the expectations will be so great, it can never you can never meet those expectations. Sure. Some people will be disappointed automatically. And so there are those that feel that better leave while you're on top, you know, leave people wanting more, mm-hmm. which is part of the Beatles' appeal. Right. The fact that, you know, they ended when they did. Right. So, uh, you know, well, they that's didn't something that we never the, talk about here. They didn't have mm-hmm. to do it under the Beatles' name. They could have come up with a new name and just had, you know, for, what I'm saying really is not that they should have continued being the Beatles without John, just that the chemistry between the three surviving Beatles that you can hear on those records, those two mm-hmm. recordings, was so great that whatever they called themselves – they could have probably put out some really good music continuing on. That's, that's just what, what I feel. Yeah. Well, Paul and Ringo still did a lot of work together. It's just Paul and George didn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You know. Yeah, that's very true. Now, uh, in the in the fall of of ninety five, there was there was a lot of hype. There was a lot of media coverage of of the the upcoming telecast of the anthology abc of course had you know a lot invested both in terms of money and in terms of uh, potential ratings and they uh, they promoted it to the hilt even to the point of calling uh, calling themselves a beetle c uh, mm-hmm. in a nod to uh, w a beetle c uh, back in the 60s uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it all came down to that that sunday night uh, November 19th, if I remember the, 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 the date correctly, uh, 1995, and especially the last few minutes, uh, the, over the, uh, the credits for the first, uh, the first installment, uh, there's a performance of the Beatles doing You Can't Do That in Australia, and underneath uh, for those who never saw the the original telecast, underneath there was a countdown clock. Mm-hmm. Now at that point, <sighs> at that point, I'm I'm 46. You know, do the math. You know how old I am. Uh, so I, I, I'm I'm 46, mm-hmm. and I'm watching this countdown clock, and my heart is going, you know, like as if I was a 15 year old. Waiting for W.A. Beatles C to debut a new Beatles record. It was it was just an amazing, amazing experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What oh was, yeah. It was. What, what was it like for you guys? Same. Same. I mean, I, I, I my 
my eyes were watering. I was, it was, like I said, it was, clo- it, I, you know, I go back to that closure thing that it was, you know, that's what it was for me. And, and uh, my eyes were watering. I was, I got really emotional over that. So. It was exciting for me. I didn't look at it as closure. I didn't think there needed to be closure. But uh, no, it was, it was incredible. What I remember most of all, at least initially about the, the telecast, is the Free as a Bird video. Because uh, oh, yeah. my wife, well, my, my future wife and I were sitting hand in hand waiting for that moment sure. with the clock ticking. Mm-hmm. And um, the video is possibly the most amazing video I think I've ever seen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, it's not just because it's the Beatles. It's all the work that was poured into that yeah. video. Oh, yeah. And it was just... It was so tastefully done, especially at the very beginning. I mean, your anticipation is so high. And then the song doesn't even start until you're waiting for the, the bird's yes. wings to f- or flapping. Mm-hmm. So you're still thinking, where's the song? Where's the song? Where's the song? Mm-hmm. But the way that it, that it started with the camera panning in that room to the childhood photos of each of the four Beatles, mm-hmm. and then you had all these references to Beatles songs, so well crafted mm-hmm. in in this video, and people trying to figure out every single song that's in there, and did they get all of them? You've got uh, newspaper taxis here, and piggies here, and you know, there's so much work that was poured into that video. And as much as I loved watching the anthology that that first telecast, all I could think about after the end was, I got to watch the Free as a Bird video. Exactly. Again. <laughs> yes. You know, it's just. There's, that was so powerful, that video. It's just amazing, all the work that was, that was poured into that, mm-hmm. that video. It really is a work of art. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. There were... In fact, I just want to say yeah. one thing, because um, Jeff Lynn just released a new album. Mm-hmm. with uh, It's called Jeff Lynn's ELO. Right. But uh, the single, uh, When I Was a Boy, was released, and there was a video that was made. And if you watch that video, it really it's reminiscent of Free as a Bird, stylistically. Really? You know, and also, let's face it, Jeff Lynne produced the song. Free as right. So it's it's very similar stylistically if you watch that video. Anyone, if you can, go to YouTube or whatever and watch it and tell me if it doesn't remind you somewhat of Free as a Bird. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. Very interesting. In fact, uh, uh, Jeff Lynne's ELO just played in the New York area uh, over this past weekend, if, I, if I'm right. remembering correctly. Mm-hmm. Right. Irving Plaza. Yeah. Irving Plaza. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wish I could have gone. Yeah. I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. Me too, but I'm far away now. Mm. But uh, now the, the next the next sort of chain in this link is the fact that the, it had been arranged in those days. Uh, Tuesday was generally the, the new release day for any not only just major releases, but virtually any any releases of, uh, well, both both records and videos. Okay. Um, but it had been arranged that that the uh, that the, the first of the three two disc Beatles anthology sets would be released the next day, uh, that, uh, that Monday. And there were a lot of record stores that opened up at midnight. So there were probably some people who, who didn't actually see free as a bird because they were, uh, cause they were, they had put them on videotape in those days <laughs> and, mm. uh, were waiting online at record stores to get the, the first of the, um, of the, the three, uh, two disc sets. Now, I imagine, let's see. Now, Alan, had you gotten, I guess, a truncated version of... No, no. Um, I don't believe I had. Um, I probably got it the next morning. Uh Um, hmm, I really can't remember, you know, I mean, because going out at midnight and standing online was actually something I used to do for like when, remember when pepper came out on yes, CD and, right. and some of the others. So, uh, but I know that I, I sat in front of the TV. So obviously, uh, I, I'm not sure what time it was over. Do you remember? It was, was 11. It like, it was 11. Okay, mm-hmm. so I, I could have made it down to tower at yeah. midnight. You know, yeah, so right. I might well have I, re- I, I remember going to borders because I, in fact, I still, I have a T-shirt that they gave away that night. Yeah, I, still have. I remember the one. Yeah, 
So yeah, I remember I went to Borders and Borders had a bunch of had you know they were giving away little prizes. I don't think they were giving away CDs, but they gave away little you know gave away things and they had T-shirts and stuff. And so yeah, they were they had a big promotion for that. Uh, I remember. Ken, how about you? Hmm. I'm sure I would have bought it the next day. Okay. You know, I wouldn't have. I don't think I went out at midnight locally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I'm sure the next day I would have picked it up. Yeah, right. While having free as a bird in my head all night. Yeah, right. sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In fact, there. Yeah, even even the uh, the two disc set. There had been no there had been no leaks at all. I think right. there. Mm -hmm. I think the only the only sort of quote unquote leaks would have been people playing from bootlegs songs that were reputed to be on the uh, uh, you know on the set. But not, mm -hmm. but not the actual finished products. The obvious question is, what did you guys think of the first set? I wasn't crazy about the narration being included. I, I, mm -hmm. I could see why they did it, but I thought, you know, I, I wish this were just the music without the, the uh, narration. And, and after the first, they dropped it. I think a lot of people must have felt that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, yeah, there were great things on there. I mean... You know, having collected everything that you could collect yes. on bootlegs, um, <laughs> I thought I had heard an awful lot of stuff, right. but I was very happy to hear things like, uh, you know, the, the version of that'll be the yes and in spite of the spite of all the danger. I mean, we heard snippets of them the first night on the on, on the documentary, but um, uh, you know, and then there were some things that we'd always had, like Decca tapes and um, the Tony Sheridan things. But then it got into some outtakes, and uh, and those were really fun. I'm just sort of looking at the the list of how far they went on that first one. You know, it was a little bit of a kick having uh, you know those the the demo and complete version of I'll Be Back, which mm -hmm. were you know. Uh, an outtake of Mr. Moonlight, which, you know, by then was sort of high on the list of, as we've talked about before, of, of, of unfavorite songs. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. I mean, it's good hearing a, a different one. Leave My Kitten Alone, we all had been, you know, collect, we all had somewhat less high quality copies. Sure. But that was one of those um, tracks that people had known about since the early 80s mm -hmm. and uh, finally mm -hmm. was bootlegged in about 84 but um you know that was something that i think everybody was eager to have in the official catalog eventually so mm -hmm. oh and then those eight days a weeks i mean the version of eight days a week on anthology i just love you know i i'm mm -hmm. very happy really? with the decision they made to use the one that was the finished version but i i loved hearing the experimentation that they were doing with that mm -hmm. song you know, and uh, yeah, you know, it, it was another one of those things where, you know, getting to peek into the Beatles sessions and hearing versions that were completely different from what they released, you you sort of got the feeling that, you know, they had so many good ideas. You know, if it was 2015, every single one of those would have come out. You know, people now release a track with 18 different versions and remixes. Mm -hmm. Sure. So sort of wonder if, you know, they, if they had put eight days a week out as a, a single initially, uh, which in England, of course, they didn't. But uh, mm -hmm. if it had come, would have come with some of these different versions, if it were if it were today's kind of record industry. Of course, you also have, a, you know, something like, you know, what what to do. Yeah. Which yeah. Uh, which, you know, you can you can kind of see why uh, that wasn't included on, on, on Beatles uh, on Beatles for sale or Beatles 65. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my, kinda like I said, the, the Beatles had a, a great ear for what their best material. Exactly. Was. Yeah. Except mm -hmm. except the way they treated George at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With all the stuff that uh, wound up on all things was passed that they didn't that they didn't release themselves. Yeah, so. that's right. true. Yeah, Ken, what did you think of the first set? I liked it a lot. I think overall, um, the, Volume Two is probably the most interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the three of them. But um, what fascinates me the most in any of these three volumes would have to be when you've got different arrangements of Beatles songs or earlier versions, mm -hmm. and you hear bits that didn't work out. 
or bits that were not included in the finished product, like And I Love Her, without having the, the four-note guitar intro. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, the middle bit, A Love Like Ours Will Never Die, that was not in that version. Right. Or hearing I'll Be Back in three-quarter time, mm-hmm. which definitely did not work out. Right. Um, yeah. Where I think it suffers, and this is just me being very greedy here, mm-hmm. um, I'm not a big lover of doing things piecemeal. So uh, to have five of the deck audition songs mm-hmm. of the 15, you know, to me, all 15, because historically it's all so important, I'd love to have that come out as one disc by itself. How do you pick five out of 15, which are the best? Same thing later on with the White Album demos. How do you pick which ones deserve to be on there? Mm-hmm. I'm sure that those of us who, who know all the White Album demos would think, you know, Revolution should have been on there or, or something else that wasn't included. So, um, and what do you pick from the Tony Sheridan recordings? Or should you pick any at all? Mm-hmm. You know, does that, is that the same category as the Fab Four? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how much, do you, how, how much do you put in of the 1960 Quarrymen rehearsals? You know, I love that stuff. You'll Be Mine, is that one of the best recordings of all of them? I don't know. But, uh, you know, when you do things piecemeal like that, it leaves me wanting more. And it makes me want the entire uh, list of songs for each one to come out individually as a CD, which I think certainly with the deck of stuff and the White Album demos, it deserves. Absolutely. Um, but it's also, it, it is interesting to hear You'll Know What to Do, just because for so many years we heard about that song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's a decent song. It's not great. You can tell it's weaker than anything that George released of the songs that he wrote as a, as a Beatle. Very true. But um, it's it still is interesting interesting to hear that. Same thing with um, later on with If You've Got Trouble, which yes. is a fairly, yeah. a fairly weak song, but it's nice, you know, nice to hear even their weaker stuff mm-hmm. and to know why they didn't make uh, the cut. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Steve? Uh, I'm really mixed on the first volume because I think they, like you like you said, the uh, the talking kind of ruined the um, you know the pace of it. Uh, I and I'm glad they changed that, but I'm glad they put "Leave My Kitten Alone." I'm glad they put the the Sweden tracks, which uh, you know was a good show. Mm. Um, the one thing that uh, I think was, I'm glad that everybody finally got to hear was "How Do You Do It." I'm glad they I'm glad they threw that on there. They also I'm just looking in here, I forgot they had thrown on the Love Me Do with Pete Best. Right. Which when we were talking about Love Me Do and Andy White and Ringo, we right. we didn't even we forgot about that. And uh, that's kind of been forgotten now, but this is where you know, this is where you get it. But you know, I think I'm glad that they put it together. I think overall there was some talk uh, um that at one point they were considering a six CD set instead of doing this separately. Right. I think that would have been, I th- I kind of think that would have been a good idea. Actually, they could have done three, six CD sets. And exactly. I would have, been happy. I, would have I would have been happy, <laughs> yeah. you know, but yeah, because two just doesn't seem like enough. And, and what Ken said about piecemeal really comes into play when you, when you get some of the stuff that's in here, you know, I was listening to the um, iTunes anthology highlights the other day and, some of those tracks, you just kind of go, "Ooh, wow! Why did they pick that?" You know, um, mm-hmm. there was there there are some things that uh, you really wonder why they why they did what they did and why they didn't do other you know do other things. But you know, I'm you know I mean for, you can't, for instance, well the 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 yes it is the way they cut that up and and you know, did the piecemeal thing on the mm. the third volume, which really. Irritate. I know that got a lot of uh, comment uh, at the time, and and it's something that I've never really adjusted to, especially since the two takes were out there. I mean, they were in the they were in bootleg land. Why not just put them out? You know, yeah. <laughs> why why do something like that? It doesn't make any sense. But I mean, I'm you know you know it's nice that they that they've done that. I don't know that that's ever going to happen again. I think people keep waiting for some something like that to happen and. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. Um, oh well. I'm I think we say. may. I think we may see the Deca audition come out, and we may see the White Album demos. Although, you know, the reason that these White Album demos—not that they probably would have, in any case, done them all, because it would have put too much focus on one part of the story when mm-hmm. they had two discs for the, you know, certain period of years. But they used the White Album demos that they did because that was all that George gave them. Mm -hmm. Um, He had the stereo 
originals. Um, you know, all the stuff we had was mono from the Lost Lennon tapes, um, mm-hmm. which is sort of what Yoko had available in her archive. But George mm-hmm. had the real high quality stereo recordings and he chose them and told them that that was all he had. And I am hoping that one day Danny will be rummaging through the archives and say, oh, here's the whole reel. Let's put it out, you know, mm-hmm. um, because mm. a lot of people would love that. I mean, you know, that, that those demos as a whole are just great. And it, uh, yeah. you know, showed again how creative they were at that time. You know, they'd come back from India and they had, you know, what, 28 new songs, not all of which ended up on the 30-track White Album. You know, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. an explosion of, of, of songwriting there. So, Well, you know, the other day I, I slipped onto my, my uh, iPhone, the uh, Christmas album, and that the fact that we don't have that... You know, mm-hmm. uh, especially at this time of year, is I think a tragedy. Uh, it really should be out there. Uh, you know, the, well, maybe, the, maybe not a tragedy, but I but it is <laughs> but it is kind of silly that they haven't. You know, they could put it out so easily. Right. You know. Right. I mean, I mean, they even have a. You know, I mean, I have a legitimate. Um, you know, LP version of it from the fan club from mm-hmm. 1971. Mm-hmm. Right. So it you know it wouldn't take a whole lot of effort for them to put to put them out you know and, you know even with a few outtakes. Yeah, and at this point there's quite mm-hmm. a lot of outtakes available, yeah. and uh, not to mention that you know the version that we have of Christmas Time is here again, which is you know six some six or seven minutes, mm-hmm. um, is really all from this um, so-called EMI boardroom tape, where. They're just playing a tape for EMI executives Mm -hmm. and someone is recording it with an open mic. So except for the little bits that were on the anthology singles, um, which is yet another aspect of this anthology thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Put out some singles Mm -hmm. with some tracks that weren't on the the thing. We we have some snippets of uh, Christmas Time is Here Again from there. But, you know, they've got the the studio quality version they could be putting out. Right. Right. Very true. Yeah. Um, uh, again, this is something uh, something that is kind of outdated now. But back 20 years ago, there was a very popular thing called CD singles. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there were basically an outgrowth of the old uh, the old final 45s. And uh, and in a lot of cases, and certainly uh, certainly Paul McCartney made uh, great use of this. Uh, mm-hmm. There would be. Indeed. Indeed, there would be, you know, <laughs> bonus tracks, sometimes multiple bonus tracks that had not appeared anywhere else. And it was and that was done again in the case of the CD singles of both uh, Free as a Bird and uh, and Real Love, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I- including, as Alan just said, the uh, that version of Christmas Time is here again. Right. That, yeah. You know, that the that was the kind of precursor to Ringo doing doing that song on his, on his Christmas album. Right. Yeah. Something else that we were talking about before, uh, before we began recording was the fact that, you know, one of the things that makes it so amazing that this was 20 years ago is that both in, you know, in the telecast of the, um, of the anthology of the original broadcast version of the anthology, and then in the video cassette version, and then in the DVD version, because of the fact that this was through Apple and it was the, you know, the authorized version, uh, we got to see what we perceived at that time to be master quality uh, video from Let It Be, from the Beatles at Shea Stadium. And I can remember mm-hmm. how, how great that material looked at that point. And then now we have a lot of some of that same footage on the one plus set and it looks that much better than it looked 20 years ago. Right. You know, this, well, I'm, I'm sure most of us thought as soon as we saw that, let it be footage, let it be. It's coming out. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that was, uh, <laughs> 20 well, years ago, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we're still waiting and we're still, and we're still, uh, we're still waiting. Uh, any thoughts on the, the second and third, um, anthology sets that continued the kind of the the link of this whole chain of events 
connected with the, the anthology project. I think pretty much what we said about the first, except that, you know, with the later ones and the second one, I, I think Ken was right, is the most interesting. And yet it had its frustrations, too, because, you know, outtakes became a different thing in that period. I mean, there there weren't, you know, whereas with the early tracks you would have them start a song and it would break down or they would take a new approach and and so you had actual sort of discrete outtakes with the pepper sessions for instance that are on that second set it wasn't so much that there were you know five different takes of this song as there are different things on the multi-tracks that they used or didn't use and so they could make an outtake out of stuff that we hadn't heard that was on a multi-track or something, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't pure outtakes in the same way that the early ones were. Mm -hmm. And, and so you had a, you had a little bit of a sense of this being, you know, it's nice to have something new, you know, no question about that, mm -hmm. but you still wonder what all the raw session tape sounded like, you know? Mm hmm. Mm. That's a really good point there, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, the most fascinating part of all these three discs, and these are my, my two favorite recordings, are take one of Tomorrow yes. Never Knows mm -hmm. and take one of Got to Get You Into yeah. My Life. Both of them, I think, are back-to-back -back mm -hmm. on volume two. Right. And uh, just to hear what they sounded like in the very beginning, and Tomorrow Never Knows is interesting because it's slower, it's still spacier. Mm -hmm. I'm not spacey. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting. How did it get from that point to, <laughs> you know, what became tomorrow never yeah, knows yeah. and, um, got to get you into my life. A song that is so strongly associated with brass mm -hmm. to hear that without brass. Yeah. Yeah. And you also hear it with that middle bit with the, I need your love mm -hmm. bit, yeah, which they yeah. eventually took out that I found to be really fascinating. It's so bare mm -hmm. that version. And it's fascinating to hear that way. And, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said there, Alan, although there's certain things like there's a different take of Fool on the Hill, which I think is wonderful right. on volume two. Uh, a, it's a lot of good stuff on there. Across the Universe is really the really a beautiful version. And since you mentioned, oh, yeah. since you mentioned, um, you know, the got to get you into my life and tomorrow never knows that the one track right after it is that and your bird can sing which is a hoot where they're cracking up right right that was a lot of fun to hear i thought mm -hmm. yeah how did how did you guys feel about just the backing tracks the instrumentation behind just hearing eleanor rigby and just hearing within you without i thought you those were gorgeous itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely mm. gorgeous it, uh the within you without you one particularly gave me like a whole new appreciation for mm. for that right. song mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's the thing about all these recordings you know i used to be when i first started out and i i know you might remember me from my early days out yes. but i was very anti-bootleg <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. i was anti-bootleg back true. then but i have what I've was wrong done with a you three... <laughs> <laughs> yeah really you got better <laughs> Well, I changed. I've, I've done a 180 since then, but certainly the anthology gives you good reason for exploring all these different takes to, to understand how the songs finished up the way they did and uh, makes you realize how much more work was put behind these songs. And it could be something as simple like what we just said, within you, without you, hearing just the instrumentation, that alone, and hearing how gorgeous that sounds, you know, all the work put behind that. So when you hear different takes and different mixes, that can help to give you a, an entirely new appreciation. You know, a few years ago, there was a bootleg that came out that had songs from Help and Rubber Soul, but the main difference was that the vocals weren't double-tracked. Mm -hmm. And you would think that something like that wouldn't make that big a difference, mm -hmm. but it did. <laughs> it made the song sound much more live, like you were right there in the studio, mm -hmm. and it made you realize how much double-tracking did to vocals. Yeah. So just something that simple alone, that little technique, made a huge difference in those Beatle recordings. So anytime you hear anything slightly different in a Beatles recording, you can find something there that you never heard before. I guess that applies to most music. But, um, you know, the Beatles anthology. And certainly you have to point to Strawberry Fields Forever oh. and the different takes that they presented here. I think it was, it was edited just right, mm -hmm. just going from the acoustic demo to all of take seven mm -hmm. 
which is interesting to hear that kind of thing. Yeah, it's just they did everything just right with with the, how they presented Strawberry Fields. I loved uh, Take One too. That was that's that's haunting in and it of really itself is, the way yes. that it that first started. So. Yeah, yeah, very much so. In fact, as as Alan knows, there was a, a, a complete album, bootleg album, of ba- basically the entire chronology of Strawberry Fields Forever. Right, and right. Uh, uh, so you know, I think this was. Uh, as you say, Ken, I think they they did they struck just the right balance in kind of doing, in a sense, the highlights of that whole chronology. Except mm-hmm. right. Except uh-huh. in take one, uh-huh. um, as we had already heard when the tapes of the Abbey Road video session, you know, when they closed Abbey Road and had people come in and watch a little I... historical presentation, and also some other tapes that had leaked out. Uh, there was a version of take one different from the one presented on the anthology in that in the last verse, there were vocal harmonies and in the anthology, they didn't, they chose for whatever reason, not to include those vocal harmonies. And I can't figure out why, because they're just beautiful and, uh, Mm -hmm. but they're not in that version. So, you know, one of the big mysteries. So, uh, you know, and again, so here the anthology, yes, here it is. It's officially released, but it doesn't so, sort of close the book on the bootlegs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much so. Steve, let me ask you this. Um, yes. Now, the the third anthol- anthology set, even though it didn't go, well, even though it did go to number one, all three sets went uh, went to number one on the, uh, at least on the on Billboard's album chart. Even though it went to number one, it was kind of perceived by some people to be a disappointment, partly because of the fact that there was no new song on that one, and right. partly because, I don't know, maybe people were disappointed in the, in the material. What, uh, what were your thoughts? Um, I, yeah, probably. Um, I mean, I, it, I, again, having, it's hard for me to, to really evaluate it completely because most people like a lot of people i mean i picked up a lot of the bootlegs in those days so a lot of the stuff was familiar to me like not guilty and Mm -hmm. and, you know things like that Uh, taking uh, you know taking the the outtakes out of context really isn't the same as sitting there listening to them listening to the takes back to back to back to back like on um you know, unsurpassed masters um, mm-hmm. on those. I have to say, I, I think that spoiled me a lot, an awful lot. I mean, uh, and and again, the, the 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 manipulating they did with the outtakes didn't please me a whole lot. Um, All right, good night. I guess is probably the most obvious one, and on mm. the third volume. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that that kind of thing just bothers me, and and uh, you know. Yeah, I just didn't appreciate it. I mean, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad they did all this stuff. And there are a lot of things that we didn't hear, you know, for example, that while my guitar gently weeps, which we actually had heard, but finally everybody else got to hear it, you know? So, I mean, there's, I mean, there's some, there are some masterpieces on here, but, uh, you know, the manipulating of the outtakes just is really irritating, Mm -hmm. you know? Was there enough of the, of the get back material? Was there too much of the get back material? They really didn't put that much on there. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, um, yeah, they sure um, did. There's a yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking through the. I'm looking through track list further down on the track list now. Yeah. Nice hearing. Yeah. All things must pass. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know. I still wish. That's another thing. I still wish they'd put out the the real Get Back album. But <laughs> it's it's out there if you want it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this you know, there's some there there's some good stuff on here. Um, the uh, the version of Long and Winding Road, that is the take that Phil Spector used, mm-hmm. but without all of the uh, the orchestration and all. And like Alan, Alan likes um, uh, li- uh, Life with the Lions. I like What's the News, Mary Jane. I love that. Yeah, always have. Teach his own. I say I, <laughs> I, I, I say nay on that yeah. one too. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Now there, uh, uh, there was of course a coffee table book and a uh, video cassette release in the fall of '96, uh, and as we mentioned uh, a few years later, a DVD release. And we can uh, save that until another time because this hour uh, plus has flown by. 
this is a, uh, a, a really fun discussion of, uh, of what I remember as a, uh, a, a very fun event series of events, if you will, for, uh, for Beatles fans, the entire Beatles anthology project. And, uh, let's see, uh, Steve, if you, if, uh, folks want to get in touch with us, how did they do that? We have a, a Facebook page, things we said today. We have, actually have two Facebook pages. There's a group and a radio station page. You can, uh, email us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this show. Or, all, or, some, or any of the other shows that we've done, or you can follow us on Twitter at Things We Said Fab, mm-hmm. and the, the, and then and you can also contact us individually. And I've been I've gotten a couple of notes uh, individually from people. We all have individual email addresses. Um, minus Beatles Examiner at Gmail dot com. Um, everybody can kind of give theirs, but yeah, you can you can get all of us that way too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, uh, Alan. Ken, any uh, anything you you two need to promote? Uh, just my website, uh-huh. which is kenmichaelsradio dot com. There's lots of interviews on the website with people connected to the Beatles. In fact, a uh, recent guest of ours, Kid O'Toole, you'll find a new interview with mm-hmm. her on uh, on the website. And also, there's my um, there's my email address, which is every little thing at att dot net, and my Facebook page. At Ken Michaels. Okay, Alan? Okay, well, you can look for my um, earlier of my two Beatles books, which is now called The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and originally came out around the same time as the anthology. And uh, otherwise, you can contact me through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, or by email at alancozen at gmail.com. Okay, and since we just passed the 52nd anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy, I probably should uh, <laughs> do, the, do the classless thing and promote Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped the Generation, which takes a look at the, the period from November 22nd, 1963 through March 1st, 1964, that included the Kennedy assassination, the breakthrough of the Beatles in America, and a whole lot more. And uh, that can be uh, obtained uh, uh, at Amazon.com or through www.paradingpress.com. And you can get in touch with me through, through there and through www.beetlefan.com, at Facebook, uh, at Al Sussman, and on Twitter uh, at ASUSS49. Uh, and uh, this has been, as I said, this has been a, a, a fun hour and some some distance. Uh, so for <laughs> <laughs> so for Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, this is Al Sussman, and we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>